Thank you, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Coffee and Issues. I'm joined by my regular co-host, Mr. Michael Lejeune here. Hey, Michael. Hey, how's it going, man? We're doing great, man, and thank you for joining us again, waking up, getting up out the bed today to come and take part in some good GovCon it's late, conversation. It's, it's sort of late in the day here. It's noon. And I'm excited uh, this week as well to join us is Nicole Potroff from the law firm of Coprince McCall Potroff LLC, and she's our guru. And I wanted to invite Nicole today because the topic that we're going to be talking about is issues with being the middleman. And so there's some problems that you might run into depending upon how you're looking to structure your business in GovCon. There's certainly a lot of folks that participate as resellers, value-added resellers, and prime contractors that work as integrators with other subcontractors. So there's certainly a lot of what you consider, can consider the middleman. But what you really want to avoid and be careful of, and we actually had an issue submitted on to our platform, govology.com forward slash issues about topics associated with being the middleman. And so I think what we want to really be careful of is that you don't want to be a small business just thinking that you're going to come in here, leverage your small business set aside to kind of broker deals or be a middleman where you're just going to say, hey, I'm going to get the opportunity, but we're going to pretty much let the subcontractor perform all the work, and we're just going to collect a little bit of a royalty on that. That really doesn't work. That's called a pass-through. And so this is what we're going to talk about today is like how you can actually be somewhat of a middleman if you are a reseller or any of those other aspects, but it's also what to understand and avoid when it comes to the rules of playing that game. But also, Michael and Nicola, there's some other elements that come into play. I have a little tip that I'll talk about. One consideration that might cause issues outside of the legal perspective for small business set-asides. But I know you guys as well have seen this a lot. So, Nicole, thank you for joining us and taking some time today to share some of your legal perspectives and insights. And I want to give a little disclaimer on behalf of Nicole, because <laughs> this is not a forum for legal advice, but what she's going to simply help us do is understand the breakdown of some of the laws. They've been doing a lot of blogging lately about some of these regulations that we're going to be talking about. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'll start with uh, you, Nicole. And one of the biggest things I see propping up as an issue from the get-go with a small business wanting to participate in small business set-asides and looking at this idea of just being like the broker or the middleman is that they're not really seeing some of the regulations that apply to small business set-asides in the context of things like the non-manufacturer's rule, things like limitations on subcontracting, and things like ostensible subcontracting which is related somewhat, but maybe you could talk about some of those specific three things, how those might impact a small business. And I know we could do a, probably a whole webinar on each of those ones, but just like a quick breakdown on why these regulations produce these challenges that small businesses need to really understand in terms of trying to do it the right way. Yeah. And I'll keep it real big picture and then we can kind of go into more specifics on it. But Generally, anytime you've got a contract that's set aside for small business or one of those other socioeconomic statuses, so 8A, WOSB, SDVOSB, hub zone, you will have limitations on how much work needs to actually be done by the qualifying entity. So the entity that qualifies for the work being the prime contractor here, obviously the prime would have to be the one that qualifies to get the award. Then the question becomes, you know, how much of that work can I basically rely on other people for? How much do I have to have here? When you talk about services contract, you generally are talking about the limitation on subcontracting. So that's going to be for general services contracts, a 50% limitation, specialty trade, construction, there's different kinds, they have different limitations. 50 is about as, as tight of, as it gets. Other than that, you usually have a little more leniency on how little the prime can do. But essentially, usually the contract itself or the solicitation itself will say, it's one of those FAR clauses that is a limitation on subcontracting. We always went off the SBA one because the FAR one, frankly, was a mess for years and years and years and just finally got updated. But I will figure out what exactly that was. But basically, it's going to have the clause in there that you, most of the time, 
And if it doesn't, that's a great time to reach out to your CEO, even before you get the contract, even just bidding and say, hey, I just wanted to clarify which limitations on subcontracting apply to this contract. It is FAR 52-21914. So this does now pair it directly, the SBA one, which is 125.6. And so it gives you limitations. As the prime that qualifies for this work, you have to do a certain amount of the work. And I guess one of the big misconceptions a lot of people have is that you have to self-perform that amount of the work. And that's not necessarily the case. Under the old FAR rule, it was, but the new FAR rule and the SBA rule both talk about these similarly situated entities. So in a nutshell, if you've got a small business set-aside contract and you've got some small business subcontractors and some large business subcontractors, any work that's going to a small business can kind of count in that pool of that small business subcontracting and small business self-performing work that has to be at least 50%. And so then you can kind of do what you want with the other 50%. So in a very, very big picture nutshell of that, that's kind of how that works. When you get into mixed contracts and supplies contracts, that's when you start really having more questions on what's going to apply, whether it's the limitations on subcontracting, whether we're doing a supplies makes code, where then you would either need to be the manufacturer itself, which clearly isn't going to be the subject of today because we're talking about kind of middleman. So then there's this non-manufacturer rule that you would need to comply with if you are not the manufacturer. And we can probably get into more details of that shortly, but in a nutshell, the non-manufacturer rule is kind of an approach with a couple prongs to it that basically says the business that's not manufacturing the work can qualify as this non-manufacturer if they themselves do not exceed 500 employee size standard. So it's an employee size standard, not a annual receipts-based one like the limitation on subcontracting is typically going to look at when it's determining whether you're a small or similarly situated entity under that contract. This one's going to look at employees. So size standard of the actual non-manufacturer will need to be 500 or less. You will need to be primarily engaged in the retail or wholesale of the items that normally selling that type of product being supplied. That's usually demonstrated by showing tax returns, finances, pointing to these type of sales being something that is standard for that business. And then you need to take ownership or possession of the item with your personnel, your equipment, or your facilities. There's a whole plethora of case law out there about what take ownership means and exactly what qualifies and what doesn't. I'm sure we'll get into some of the more nuances as we go here, but I'm trying to keep it big picture for now because exactly as Carol said, I could probably do a different webinar in each one of these topics and we don't have time for that today. So, and then the final one is that you supply the end product of a small business manufacturer processor in the United States, or you have a waiver. There's a couple kinds of waivers. There's a class waiver, and then there's a contract specific waiver that says, look, for this contract, we're going to waive this fourth bullet, this fourth element. Or there's also a class waiver that says, look, generally there's not small businesses that provide this. That's things often like airline travel, other things. I can't think of many off the top of my head, but other things that just small businesses don't typically do. So it's okay to say, look, we do have to provide something from a large business here. We can't do this small business situated in the US. But keep in mind, that's the only one of the four factors that can be waived. So all of those other ones would need to be met. Typically, you're looking at limitation on subcontracting or non-manufacturer rule, or you are the manufacturer. But for purposes of today as the middleman, you're definitely going to be looking at those other two generally. So I'll kind of do that as big picture for now. I briefly mentioned ostensible subcontractor rule, which is definitely a rule that is not a limitation on subcontracting rule per se. It is actually an affiliation rule. So what that does is if you were to have a small business prime, get this award, but the small business prime starts just handing out massive amounts of the important parts of the contracts, the primary and vital parts of the contract to a large sub. And it starts kind of being unduly reliant on that sub. So it it could not perform. This sub quit, they'd be in trouble, big, big trouble. So that's kind of the other part there you have to keep in mind. So while that is an affiliation rule, it's contract specific affiliation. So if you are deemed by SBA to have an ostensible subcontractor, you don't have to panic that that's going to be forever and ever your affiliate. It's your affiliate for the contract at hand. So if you both add your sizes together and you still don't meet that size standard, then you can lose an award, lose a contract, and there can actually be other consequences. Some of the rule updates talk about those as well. But just recently, we've had a really good rule update that's going to clarify things a bit in our many, many times defending against the ostensible subcontractor allegations that our clients have gotten. We've said, look, we're complying with the limitation on subcontracting. So shouldn't that be 
a defense here. I mean, if we're only contracting out 50%, I would say there's at least some argument there that that's not probably going to be all of the primary year and vital work that you need to do. So the good news is SBA has recently issued some rules that do make that a defense. And one of the exceptions is construction contracts because you can't do a construction contract and go ahead and meet that limitation on subcontracting, which actually only requires you to do 15% of the work. But that one specifically talks about the type of work that SBA believes is primary and vital. And it's supervising, managing, controlling subcontractors. So that is one exception in this new rule that's coming out. It does say, even if you meet the limitation on subcontracting for that one, you could still potentially violate the primary and vital. And again, I think that's kind of two-pronged. One, because that's such a small percentage, you only have to do 15. And two, because we know what that primary and vital work is. And so we want to make sure that's not going out. Whereas for services contracts generally, There's a whole analysis you have to do to figure out what that primary and vital work is. So that's big picture on those three kind of really big topics we could do whole webinars on and then turn it back to Carol and we can go into more details on some of those aspects. Yeah, that was great recap on all of those things. I don't want to go to Michael here, but I want to just say we're going to come back to a few of these things. I want to talk about a little bit of, of the specifics, but Michael, what do you see when it comes to folks that are coming into the marketplace? I mean, either with some of the regulation or even maybe other issues that might crop up that might present issues and challenges to them being able to get the contracts. One of the things that I see that's a really big problem, and I don't really know where this originated. Maybe it started somewhere around COVID, maybe a little bit before, but there's been a lot of a surge of people that kind of do what you and I do that only want to talk about the middleman. And the focus has been selling a course or something to people who are brand new to government contracting. I would say to people that almost can't spell government contract, like you're so brand new that you don't know what you don't know. And there's a lot of these people out there, in my opinion, this is just Mike's opinion, kind of preying on these people that are brand new, trying to get into the market and saying, go buy my course. I'll show you how to be a middleman. You don't need a product. You don't need a service. You don't need a staff. You can do this from your home. You don't need a credit line. It's so easy to sell to the government. The government is trying to sell stuff to minority-owned companies, status companies, and they're in such a need that this is going to be a home run for you. If you just go buy my course, that's $900, $1,500, whatever dollars, I'm going to teach you how to make millions of dollars in your underwear right from your bedroom with just a laptop and a cell phone. I'm not exaggerating when I throw that out there as the pitch. I mean, that is the pitch I'm seeing. And there's dozens that I know of. And every week I hear of more of these people that I've never heard of before. I'm like, I've never heard of this person. And they're selling the course on this because somebody will reach out, hey, do you know Bob Smith over in whatever? I'm like, never heard of him. Show me the website. And I'm like, oh, it's another middleman strategy trying to do this. And so the middleman strategy does work. I'll say that with a lot of caveats, right? And Nicole talked about a bunch of the rules and regulations and those kind of things, which they don't really talk about in the advertising or marketing of these middleman programs that are out there. You learn it the hard way once you get in. But it's not in the marketing because if they told you, hey, there's all these rules you got to comply with, you probably wouldn't drop $1,500 on their course, right? So the first thing that I I really want people to understand is to be extremely wary of this as a core business model that you're being pitched. That's the first thing because it's not a core business model. It's just not. It, It may get some people into the market, but again, it's one of those things when people approach me, I'm like, well, it depends. Yeah. You know, and the second thing that I see for a lot of people is they're like, well, what should I sell? And they're starting to look at things and I'm like, well, what do you know? Because if you've never been a business owner and you've never done business with the government, you have two uphill battles out of the gate, how to be a business owner, how to sell to the government. You're going to throw a third one in of trying to learn a product that you've never heard of. Like, I don't know anything about engines and engine parts and all that, but I heard the government buys a lot of that. So I want to sell that. Like, Mm -hmm. do you have a background in it? Nope. Okay. Well, this is going to be difficult for you, right? So when somebody comes to me, I just had a guy the other day, he was like, man, I really want to do this. We're currently, they have an arborist business. So they do a lot of tree work and things like that. He's like, but I want to sell engine parts. 
like, why? Why are you choosing that? And he was one of the few people that actually had a background. He was like, when I've been coming up over the years, I know ins and outs of all these stuff. I know the manufacturers. I know those kind of things. I'm like, okay, well, then you can go down that route. But if you told me something you don't know, then I'm going to be like, man, you got three strikes against you. This is going to be really difficult. So when you're coming into this market and the middleman is your strategy, I always tell people, go with a product you understand or a service you understand. If you're a general contractor today, you know, like Nicole was talking about on the contracting side, that's a strategy where you can be somewhat the middleman, but you need to do things that you understand because again, it's an uphill battle for people who are brand new and don't know any of that type of stuff. If you've been in the market and you're more of a well-established business and you're trying to add this to your business, you're most likely going to do it as a VAR, you know, a value-added reseller. And the thing I always say is, you got to bring the V to this game, you know, because a lot of people don't bring the value add. Yeah. They just want to say, I just want to sell the product. I just want to sell one. Well, what value are you adding? Because if you're not adding value, then the challenge is going to be, well, how many people sell Salesforce licenses or SAP licenses or Microsoft licenses? Well, there's thousands, maybe tens of thousands. So what's the value you provide why they would buy from you? and figuring that type of stuff out. So it's not as clear cut and dry as a lot of these courses out there make it out to be. And you've got to think through this a little bit more. And then you've got to deal with regulations, restrictions, all those kind of things. So that's my cautionary tale out of the gate here is to just be weary of the model and understand it's not a core business model for most folks. It's just not. Because the other downside, even if you are a VAR, The government wants a big discount. So guess what? Even if you're selling $100,000 worth of product, you might make 6 or 8%. Then you've got credit card fees if you have credit card fees. So can you live on six grand? Probably not. So how many of those contracts do you have to win to actually make a living? A lot of them. You know, even if you're doing a million dollars in sales, I mean, it's a decent income, but it's a million dollars in sales. And so- that may be 10, 12, 15 contracts for you to win. So just thinking through those types of things is what I always caution people when they're talking middleman, profitability, knowing the product or service you're trying to sell. Those are just some of probably my opening thoughts hmm. around it. So You've hit a lot of nails right on the head. And I'll, I'll quickly, I'll, I'll share a story that relates exactly to what you were saying, Michael. And not a lot of people know this, but before we launched Scovology, I used to like to play the guinea pig, you know, and I like to used to look at these things that were people were saying out there about do this, do that. And, and we actually, for about a year, we were kind of doing some construction things and we were, the majority of what we were selling, we were doing some construction supply sales and having kind of knowing all of these rules and trying to bake them into everything, it made it challenging from a number of aspects. One aspect was one of the things that Nicole brought up earlier with this notion of you having to take possession like of the material with your personnel, property, ownership, et cetera, right? So then I started saying, well, you know, a lot of resellers are just really kind of drop shipping from the manufacturer to the end user. And how do we actually get this done, you know, legally? I mean, can we say, hey, if we basically take possession virtually by putting insurance when it leaves like the destination and we're, we kind of own it in transit and it gets to the other side, does that comply with the, the non-manufacturer's rule and all of that stuff? By the way, for those of you guys who are resellers, if you don't have the manufacturer NAICS codes built into your profiles, you're going to want to have those, even if you're not the manufacturers, because that's kind of the essence of the non-manufacturer's rule in a weird way. And mostly the government will buy even from the resellers through the manufacturer's NAICS codes. So that's one little tip. But let me kind of continue my story and I'll make it as quickly as uh, shortly as possible. But before I do that, Mike, one thing that you said that's really rings true is like you see all these pop up like gurus who's like, hey, just do this. You make millions of dollars like I did. When I see that, there's a couple of things that I think about. Like number one, I know that because every contractor's journey is a little bit differently, whatever that person was selling might be different than what you sell. And you need to understand the rules and regulations around what you sell, not necessarily around what somebody else sells. I'll also say this, 
even if they did make a couple million dollars or a million dollars in sales selling to the government for a short period of time, where are they now? Are they still selling to the government? Did they do it right? I mean, if you look at the story of War Dogs, which I know a lot of people have seen the movie, I recommend actually listening to the audio book if you ever want to really hear something very intriguing. But you could get a person like that come out and be like, hey, I sold hundreds of millions of dollars to the government. Let me tell you how I did it. Doesn't mean that they did yeah. it right. But as we did this for a year, we made about 300000 in sales. And you also, not only that, but you have to make sure that you're flowing down the appropriate regulations to your contractors and your suppliers, right? Both in an official RFQ, so they can give you the right pricing. If it says that you've got to get your product over, if it's coming from overseas on a U.S. flagged vessel, that needs to be carried down to those subs that ultimately is going to be part of the whole equation so you can meet your compliance and the whole nine yards. But what you said rings very true with, hey, at the end of the day, if you make five or 6% on a million dollars of sales, but a lot of folks don't account for is that that five or 6% is not profit. You got to take out also all the time you spent that entire right. year talking with suppliers, doing the work, building the RFQs back and forth and all of your time invested. So you need to take that part out and then what are you left over with? And so that's one of the other issues is if you're selling kind of like a commodity type of item, like everybody else is selling, you're probably going to be squeezed and, and pinched if you're not selling like massively, like millions and millions of dollars every year. So those are the few things that I had run into. And I was out like, this is not really worth it to do all of this work to basically actually sell for this percentage. And in fact, one of the distributors that we were working with, we ultimately said, look, why don't we just become like a, a manufacturer's rep for you? Which a manufacturer's rep is like, okay, I'm not leveraging my certification to make the sale, but I've got knowledge and I'll just help you guys get the sales. Because at the end of the day, you're basically working for a commission anyway out of it, right. you know? And so I'd rather actually have, if it's not set aside or for a particular entity, I can use my knowledge to help a company get sales and make a little commission off of that rather than have to do all of the work because now they're accountable. They've got to deal with the government at the prime contract level. And so that's a strategy that I've talked to some folks about is that maybe you consider setting up something where, yes, if it does go set aside, you can do that as a set aside and you understand the rules. By the way, I would encourage everybody, if you don't have a good GovCon attorney and you want to play this game, reach out to Nicole and have a conversation to understand like what is it you actually sell so they can help you really build a compliance plan around those sales. And that's super important. Yeah. Um, so you, know, you brought up a couple of really good ones there, Carol. You know, the drop shipping one is a pet peeve of mine for all these folks because they, they think they could just drop ship. I have a, a, a couple a quick story on that one. I had a client who sold plumbing parts they, through a third party. The government ordered like sixty thousand dollars worth of plumbing parts. And what it was was it was really about sixty thousand one dollar parts. And they drop shipped it to the customer, and then the customer went dark and they're like, why haven't they accepted the shipment? What's going on? I know so where this is going. Yeah, we're 30, 60, 90 days. Yeah, you probably heard this. We're 90 days out, can't get paid. And finally, somebody gets a hold of the customer and they're like, can we come down there? Because we see it's in your warehouse and like it's not in the warehouse. They show up. Sure enough, it's in the warehouse. It's in a far back corner because they wouldn't check it in because it wasn't labeled properly because they didn't read the directions. Now, this is a directions problem. But because they had it drop shipped, they were just like, oh, I'm drop shipping it from there to there. Right. And they were supposed to have every single part, all 60,000, in its own bag with its own label. And so the government was basically, you can label it. We can send it back to your place. So you can pay for shipping. You can label it at your place. Oh, man. Or you can pay us to do it. And they had to come out of their pocket. So they lost all their yeah. profit, plus money out of their pocket because they're like, to pay to ship it to right. our office, 60,000 plumbing. Like we can't afford that, right? So they, they didn't understand what was involved and the manufacturer was not going to label it that way and drop ship it for them. So they had that problem. The other problem I find with like when you're doing stuff like this is it's one thing when you have a really good, so this is the flip side, the positive side. 
it's one thing when you have a really good relationship with a manufacturer, but the challenge I see for a lot of new middleman people, and this is the thing to be aware of, is they'll see an RFP and it's for something that they've never sold before. And they're like, oh, well, I'll just go get a relationship with a manufacturer. You're probably not going to get that squared away in, a, in time. You're probably not going to get financing from them. You're probably not going to, to really understand the products. You're not going to understand their process. There's so many things to just go, hey, I, I'm just going to start selling plumbing products on Monday. Like there's a lot of work that goes into that because a challenge another client of ours had was the government came to them and they bought about $20,000 in power strips, which seems on the surface like a really simple transaction, right? So what happened was the power strips were back ordered, And so the manufacturer was drop shipping them as they became available. So out of that $20,000, it wound up being 36 shipments with different invoices. And because it took so long to deliver, the pricing actually changed in the client's favor. So like there was a few invoices that were 13 cents, $1.35 less than what it should have been. And you wouldn't think the government would be like, oh, cool, thumbs up. Instead, the government's mind just blows up because they're like, this invoice doesn't match what we Mm-mm. thought it was supposed to be. Yep. So they didn't want to reconcile the invoice and pay. And then you've got your internal staff doing 36 invoices for a $20,000 order because they didn't understand the process and stuff like that. So understanding how your manufacturers work, having a good relationship with them, it's key to making the middleman strategy work. When you don't have that, And you're optimistic that, oh, I'll just go and do this. It's not going to work well. And you're probably not going to get the best pricing. So, you know, if I have been working with a manufacturer for 10 years and you just show up Monday, who's getting the better price? It's not you. And then also who sells the more volume because you got these relationships that are already established. Plus they're your volume seller. So you're certainly not going to give the person that calls you up with no relationship the same volume price discount. So Man. you're already going to be outcompeted right there on yeah. price. Yeah. So, so you waste a lot of time chasing stuff you shouldn't be because, again, hey, the middleman strategy, it's so easy making money in your underwear from home, right? You know, it's so easy. <laughs> it and was so easy. Michael cautionary. would be doing it. <laughs> it's just, it yeah. Well, I mean, you're in the underwear anyway. It's the cautionary tale. of I'm not saying it doesn't work, but if you know all these things we're talking about, you can make sure to put the right mechanisms in place so that you don't have those problems. Because that, that's the biggest thing for me is that I see people get in or they've quit their job or they're out of a job. And instead of looking for a job, they're trying to sell stuff to the government. The other thing about this is not understanding the customer very well. We had a client last year that they put out about a dozen quotes for a customer that came to them in a 30-day period and asked them to quote. And so they quoted roughly $2.5 million worth of product on these 12 orders. And I'm following up, I'm following up. And um, I'm like, man, what? Tell me what's going on with those. And 90 days go by, 120 days go by, almost six months go by. And the client says, we just got a note. They canceled everything. They're out of funding. So they canceled every one of those bids, all two and a half million dollars. Because again, they did not understand the customer and their process and how things work. So, I mean, they were spending their money you know, hey, we're going to win this. We think we got the best price. And then the government just cancels every single, because it was one client that had put all those out. So, you know, so there's a lot of those little pitfalls that you don't think about when you're trying to do this. I'd say the last one to me is when you're being the middleman, you have almost zero control, right? So like if the manufacturer makes any sort of change or there's a volume issue or whatever, you have no control over that type of stuff to deliver to your customer. And that can affect you in a lot of different ways. When you are the manufacturer or when you're the service provider, you have control over what you're delivering and how you're delivering it, the quality standards, all these little things that are really, really important in a customer relationship. And so I really value those direct relationships versus the manufacturer. And I'll tell you, I said that was the last one. I have one more. I was the manufacturer at one point where we were a really small business. We were doing about $10 million a year. And at some point, you know, when I got put into a senior position at this company, this is like 20 years ago, one of the first things I said was, we're going to cancel all VAR agreements because the previous owners of the company 
had set up, I call them drug deals, the way they had done it, these really bad drug deals where we were the manufacturer and we were getting maybe a 20% profit on our own product because the government had convinced these guys, you got to go through us. We're the big prime, the big names. You would know them if I said the big names, like you got to go through us to sell to the government because we hold the contracts. And one of the first decisions I made was we're going to cancel all of our agreements. We're going to sell direct to the government. And it was a decision I made that no one outside the company had control over it. So any of those people that wanted to sell our product couldn't anymore. And again, it was one of those things where we shouldn't be the manufacturer making 20%. We're going to be making the, the bulk of the, of the money there. So yeah, the control is, is a really big one. So I, I can talk about these all day. If people know from the podcast, I'm not a huge fan of this, of this strategy. I think there's too many dollar signs for people. But like I've said a couple of times, you can do it right if you are aware of the challenges and you build the right relationships and you understand like everything else, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. Like to your point, you did it for a year and did 300,000 in revenue. That's pretty average, I would say, for a company just getting into this. So understanding it's not an overnight strategy. It takes a lot of time to build those relationships, put the pieces together. If you go into it with that, you'll be a lot more successful than most people because again, you're just aware of the facts. So I'll get off my soapbox. Thank you, Michael. And we'll turn back to Nicole here. But I did want to say too, there are case studies that companies that have done this successful, I'll just name a couple right here off the top of my head, Atlantic Dive Supply. If you ever want to look at those folks, they started out as a dive supply company. Now they sell like almost everything, but they've got their processes down. They understand the compliance elements. They understand you know, making sure their manufacturers understand how they have to package it, how they have to invoice the government. By the way, always invoice the government per order that you ship because that's the way that they pay you. They go and look to see, hey, have we got the product? Yep. Here's the invoice. Here's what we ordered. Those three match and we can pay. But like Michael alluded to, it's like if you start getting shipments with different invoices that the person can't say, oh, yep, it's here. That's going to cause you some issues. Another company that was actually in my neck of the wood is a company called Howco, H-O-W-C-O. They actually did a lot of like military sales. But again, they've got schedules. They've got their processes. They've got like whole teams of people that that's all that they do all day is basically look at requirements from the government, reach out to their manufacturers. They actually have their own processing facility, which as one of the V's that they add with the value, it's like sometimes a lot of their manufacturers will ship their products to the uh, Halco facility so that they can actually package it up into the standards that the military wants it and then on ship it to them. So those are all things to consider. And again, Nicole, I will turn it back to you. And I know you guys have probably seen a lot and had, you know, a lot of stories, both on the successes and on the failures of this uh, as well. So what is your kind of final thoughts as we look at this and, and then we'll kind of cut it and we'll take the Q and A's, but yeah. what is your kind of Jerry Springer final thoughts here? I love it. Yeah. Michael definitely brought up a couple of things that I was, oh yeah, great point. And I've got a little to add. One of the big things I would say when you are newer to being kind of the middleman to things, I highly advise not necessarily just trusting your larger business subs, your larger business manufacturing companies. I cannot tell you how many clients have come to me and said, thanks for the 8A program help. We're in, we're so happy. So now this large company wants us to get these contracts and give them all the work. So if you can just help us do that and... No matter what they're telling you here, that's not going to work. You would also be the one on the hook as the prime, not them. So one of the biggest, I think, takeaways, pieces of advice, and Michael definitely touched on this too, is find somebody that has no ulterior motive to really fill you in on the details, to look at your specific situation. I talked a little about the different kinds of limitations on subcontracting and the different kinds of how you could have a manufacturer rule here apply. You could have a non-manufacturer rule here apply. You really need someone to take a look at your contract, what NAICS code it uses. And when you get into things like mixed contracts, it gets more complicated. You divide up the contract into supplies and services and whichever is more is typically the rule you have to follow. All of it gets very complicated. And you may be thinking, well, I've got this wonderful large business sub I've worked with for a while. They're super nice. They're 
telling me that this is all going to be okay. They're not the ones that are going to be in massive amounts of trouble if it turns out you just make yourself a pass through. So if you are newer, if you don't know the rules, absolutely educate yourself. And that if you're just insistent that not be through an attorney, not my best plan, but if you're insistent, at least get out there and do some research, do the blogs, grab a handbook or two if you can find one. Shameless plug, we've got our size and affiliation handbook coming out really soon. So keep an eye on our blog if you want to know when that's released, but that talks about a lot of things regarding how you need to be careful, what you're doing to make sure you stay in your size. It mentions limitations on subcontracting, non-manufacturer, all those things. But yeah, just really making sure you are educated. Don't take somebody's word for it that has a dog in the race because they don't have a whole lot of motivation to tell you that you have to make sure you perform a certain amount. They want as much work as possible. They love getting the 8A, WOSB, small business work that they couldn't otherwise get. And I'm not saying they're even necessarily have bad intentions there as much as they don't have the same motivations to make sure those rules are being followed that you do. So it is very important that you educate yourself and make sure you know what's going to apply to your contract. And that's, I think, the biggest takeaway, kind of no matter what aspect of the conversation we're talking about. Awesome. Well, Three, three things I've got here. Uh, and one, education. We've got some great education on the Govology platform. I know Michael and Josh have also some great things at Federal Access if you guys want some education. And they've also got some great books. Get the education. Number two, I would say is get yourself with an expert. I always advocate to, I know Michael don't like the word mastermind, but I always advocate for folks having a, a mastermind network of experts that they can talk with and attorneys like Nicole that specialize in GovCon can really help you understand what you really need to do to be compliant. So middleman strategy, is it doable? Yes. Is it easy? No, not necessarily, but it's possible, but you do need the education and you do need, I think, the expert guidance to make sure that you're doing it in the right way or best case scenario is they just reject your order, worst case scenario is they have you go ahead and ship it and then tell you, hey, this is not labeled in the right way, or there's plenty of horror stories on that. That's really all I've got. Michael, do you have any last words on that as well? I think you both summed it up really, really well. I think the education being big, I really value having a team of of experts around you. I think that is really, really important. And then I think the hardest part for most people when they're doing this is internally having a bid, no bid process. Don't look at everything with dollar signs, especially when you're starting off. Focus on a niche, focus on something you know, and understand it's going to take some time. And and again, like you said, if you follow some of these guidelines, the odds are you're going to be way more successful than the people who just jump in. They're all over the map. They don't understand the products. They don't understand the services. And they're just trying to make dollars out of it. So really take your time with that. Awesome. Well, we're going to wrap up on this episode of GovCon Coffee and Issues, but if you are online with us, hang out. We're going to be doing a Q&A. If you're watching us live on Facebook, video, YouTube, and you want to join the Q&A, if you go all over to govology.com forward slash issues, you can join us over there. But with that, what we'll do is we'll say goodbye to you for now, for those of you who may be watching this on demand, and encourage you to join us on Govology Nation if you have continuing questions about this. Uh, you can get there by going to www.govology.com forward slash issues. With that, thanks, everyone. And now we're going to do some Q&A. So, Michael, can you help us out with the Q&A? Do you have them up on your screen? One of the things here, not to make fun of your issue, but I always tell people, you know, write down all your important stuff about your business because you have no idea how often I'm recording a podcast and I'll say, so, Carol, tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do. And people get the deer in the headlights when they, they're they like, I wasn't thinking about that. So what company do I work for? What's my last name? <laughs> yeah, people totally break out that. So having a little cheat sheet is an answer to uh, an issue that people have when they're having conversations with people. So that's a little bit off topic, but yeah, it's, it's kind, of, kind of important there. So somebody asked a question and probably would have been better in the moment to understand what they were talking about. Because the first one is like hotels, question mark. And uh, so I don't know what we were talking about when that one came up. By the uh, way, if you want to raise your hand, we can yeah. you know, have you come on and just kind of explain or ask your question live. So let's see the next one. So can you discuss the prime scenario in limit of subcontractor rule? Kind of a longer question there, but I think Nicole hit on this pretty well. 
unless you want to expand on this one. Nicole, can you see that question from Doug? Let me see. In the chat. And Doug, if you're here, just raise your hand. Maybe easier for you to read it than for me to read it out loud. There we go. Okay, chat is up. And... It was around 116 where Doug wrote. Yep, okay. Can you discuss the prime scenario in limit of subcontractor rule? I am just getting into government contracts, worked for AGC for 30 years, decided to utilize my service-connected benefits. I have had a hard time getting the same answer out of two people about how this works. No way. Can I manage the project and the subs as my 15% of the work? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. And you getting different answers from different people is nowhere near rare in this day and age. So it's going to depend on your type of contract. So if you go to SBA's rule at 13 CFR 125.6, that is going to lay out for you the different types. There is... I know at least three, there might be one more. There is specialty trade construction, there's construction, there's services, and there are supplies, generally supplies. You kind of have two options with supplies. You either meet the limitation on subcontracting or you kind of use this exception, which is the non-manufacturer rule. Otherwise, everything else is going to be generally going to be one of those limitations on subcontracting. So services is about 50%. Specialty trade, I'm blanking on, but I want to say it's 25%. Construction is 15%. So construction contracts, if that's what you're talking about here, if you are the prime and you have a large contract here and you are subbing out about 75% of the work and you're meeting that 15%, as long as you are doing, and the new rule, I will say, definitely check out our blog, small GovCon blog on the new rule updates because we just did a couple in a row on this new rule that's going to do a lot of very, very interesting, helpful things. Some we were really happy to see. One being the idea that if you are meeting limitations on subcontracting, generally you should not be found affiliated via uh, sensible subcontractor affiliation. So tons of big words there, but in a nutshell, you shouldn't get in trouble for subcontracting the wrong kind of work out if you are meeting limitations on subcontracting. Now, the one exception in SBA's commentary there was talking about construction contracts because they have come out and said for construction contracts, we believe the primary and vital work is, and I don't have it up to quote it directly, something to the extent of managing, supervising, and coordinating all of your subcontractors. So I'm assuming based on your language here, that's probably what you're talking about. If not, feel free to pop in and clarify. But if that is the type of contract you're on, you're doing 15% of the work, and that work is that high-level administrative management management, organization of subs, that should meet the rule, especially under SBA's newly clarified rule, because they have actually added in that language saying this is what we consider the primary and vital work for a construction contract. So most of the time, it's kind of two things you need to keep in mind. First of all, the hard number limitation, whether that be so limitations on subcontracting will be 50, 25, 15, depending on your contract. And then you also need to keep in mind that you are not giving the important parts of the work to a big sub and you are not giving that sub so much of the work and so much of the important parts of the work that you could not do this without them. And due reliance and duly reliance is what the government uses. And the good thing is now for everything other than construction, as long as you're showing that you are abiding by that hard number for limitations on subcontracting, you should be okay. For construction, you still very much need to keep in mind that we know what the primary and vital work is. You have to do that and you have to do 15% of the work. What you do with the other 75% is totally up to you. The only caveat I'll add there, because again, we could talk about this one for an hour if we wanted mm. to easily, is similarly situated entities. So in a nutshell, if you've got a small business set aside contract, your small business, let's say it's construction, you're a small business prime contractor, you have one or two large business subs and you have a small business sub. The work that you give to that small business sub because they are a similarly situated entity it is okay for you to count that toward your 15%. And it's okay for you to give some of the more important primary and vital work to that small business sub. This is something clarified in the new rule because the goal here isn't necessarily that the whole bait and switch of you're the prime, but you're giving tons of work to everyone else. That's not really SBA's concern. SBA's concern is if we say these are small business dollars, a certain amount has to go to small business. And we want a small business doing the important parts of this work also to gain the experience. We want to benefit the small business, both financially and with experience. We can't do that if we give you this work and you say, okay, we're going to 
you know, fill in the potholes and you guys are going to build everything else. Like that's not the way they want that to go. So kind of keeping both of those in mind, if you are talking about a construction contract, then yes, you should be okay. If you are the prime, you are doing 15% of the work yourself. And that's that percentage of the work is you managing subs, supervising. The big other thing is really making sure any of those super important titles required by your contracts, you're typically going to want those to be your employees. You don't want to say, we're doing all the important stuff, but the key supervisors and other key personnel are actually the sub. That's not going to help your case at all. So definitely very fact specific and why it's good to have somebody help you kind of run through that. Absolutely. And I'm going to post a link to our blog because Stephen Co. Prince, who actually found it, Prince McCall and Puttroff, did wrote a nice blog on the limitations on subcontracting for construction contractors. One of the quick things I'll say, just kind of relevant to your situation, you mentioned you were an SDVOSB. So essentially recap on what Nicole is saying. Let's just say you have a $20 million project, right? And maybe it was an SDVOSB set aside and you're looking to make your 15% pretty much by managing the project, right? But what if that 15% doesn't equate, like, what if you're managing the project really only comes to about 5% or 10% of the project? How can you actually make that compliant if you only want to do the project management? Well, the way that you do that is you do your project management, then you find another service disabled vet. If it's a service disabled vet set aside, you find another similarly situated entity, in this case, service disabled veteran that can do another portion of the work to make up that 15%. So maybe you really do 10%, but you find an SDVOSB sub, maybe they're an electrical contractor that's going to do another 5 or 10% to make up for it. Now you've got your 15% met. Correct, Nicole? Sorry. Yes. Still here. Definitely correct. Absolutely spot on. Yep. And I did post a couple links for, Carol makes a great point. The general rules there haven't changed. So Steve's original blog, Steve is absolutely one of the most knowledgeable people in the industry and taught me everything I know, definitely my mentor. So I I will plug talking to Steve all day, every day and listening to his lectures and especially his Govology presentations. I learned so much over the years, but the blog that Carol will put up is going to be a good one on the general rules. And then I just added two that are strictly on the updates that are coming with this new rule that's that's coming out. And they're not crazy updates. They're one of those things where you could easily kind of read them and think, oh, it doesn't sound that different. It's not that big a deal. A lot of them were things like, for example, we have been using the compliance with limitation on subcontracting as a defense when our clients get protested for a sensible subcontractor rule for years and years now. It hasn't been necessarily clear whether it's a total defense or just kind of helps your case. And so the new rule comes out and says, for at least some kinds of contracts, this is a total defense. If you are meeting this rule, we are not going to say that you are unduly reliant or you know, have an ostensible subcontractor here. So very, very helpful clarifications in those rules too. And one thing I might mention is it's important to stay in the know. So smallgovcon.com, they do a smallgovcon.com. They do a great job in really keeping everybody up to date. I recommend you subscribe to their blog and just stay current because what you knew last year might have changed this year, right? So we always want to stay current with this. We've got just a couple of questions left. So what I'd like to do is I see we've got a hand up by CJ Kruger. So I'm going to ask you to unmute your mic if you want to come on and ask your question. Yeah, I'm the one that posted about airlines when, or when you were talking about airlines, Nicole, what about hotels too? So I'm a woman, veteran, American Indian, small business, and I've gotten eight federal contracts being the prime for hotel services. So like North Dakota National Guard went to the Virgin Islands for training. So somebody must've been quarantined because that's never happening again. So a lot of times hotels are never small businesses. And it's a service, but I'm adding value because I can negotiate where the government can't negotiate value added. So absolutely. So I'm not a pass through because then technically I'm paying the hotels. Mm -hmm. Right. And then Mm -hmm. the hotels pay Helms Briscoe commission, which is only 5%. But when you talk about like reliance and value added and primary work, technically it's all hotel work. It's a great question. And It's going to depend totally on what each solicitation says. I will tell you, I work with clients that do really cool things that I didn't even realize the government had any interest in procuring, like throwing events, all sorts of things. And they have seen 
at least in my experience, some waivers for things like hotels, because there was no ability to go have a small business hotel provide a certain service. So there's been kind of the accepted acknowledgement that airlines, hotels, there's going to be other things that small businesses typically just don't do. So when you're looking for kind of general waivers, you can Google them. There's entire lists SBA has put out on things they kind of just consider work that small businesses cannot do. But as far as for each specific contract, you'll want to look at the NAICS code. You'll want to first figure out the tricky part is I can't make it as simple as services or limitation on subcontracting always and supplies are going to be manufacturing or non-manufacturer rule always because you get all these nuanced things like mixed contracts and you have to kind of divide everything up. So it's all going to come down to what your contract says. Once you know what your NAICS code is, what you need to follow there, that's when it becomes easier. The biggest piece of advice I can give on that is do not, do not be afraid to reach out to the CO for clarification. And this is prior to bidding. This is after you've bid. This is after you've gotten the award. The only caveat prior to bidding, a CEO may tell you, I can't directly answer this question for you, but because you raise an interesting point, I can provide it to all offerers. I can do a public amendment. I can do a right. Q&A. They do that a lot. Um, yeah. Exactly. Because it just needs to be equally. They can't provide you information no one else has. But it does not hurt. And especially in situations where you've already gotten the award and you say, hey, I got this award, but I do have some questions about meeting these requirements. I'm concerned that I can't find a small business to do X, Y, Z. Can you kind of talk me through that? Sometimes they're not very knowledgeable and kind of tell you to figure it out on your own. And there's been other times CEOs have been crazy helpful and told you this is exactly what we think. The rules are going to be here. And if you follow these, you'll be fine. Only suggestions there, make sure it's the CEO. Not the COR, not the CS. Yes, there's that authority that the CO has that nobody else has. And a lot of those nobody else's don't have any clue. And they start throwing barking orders at you and you follow them. And then later on, you find out they were totally wrong. And the first question the courts are going to ask you, did the CO tell you this or did someone else tell you this? It needs to be the contracting officer. And then get it in writing. So if you get something in writing that says, this is what we believe you need to follow. If you follow it, you're all good. That's going to be a great defense for you later on if there is a question. Okay. So if I'm, it was a small business set aside and I'm a small business. So are you saying then that the hotels are my subcontractors that are big businesses? Yeah, in a way. Yes. And that's most of the time, the definition of subcontractor in both SBA and FAR is extremely broad. Independent (laughs) contractors. I've even had, we've done big analyses for people when it came to things like equipment rental. Is that going to be a subcontract? Do I have to count that? Um, And I wish there was an easy answer, but the question, the answer kind of came out to more of something along the lines of how long are you renting the equipment? Is the equipment rental something that you are doing regardless of one specific contract? Is it something where you, Mm -hmm. for if you're doing a ton of construction work and you have a skid loader and you have the skid loader that you use for 10 different contracts, should that be counted as subcontracted work Arguably, no, because this is a a something you have to have. This is you acquiring services, no different than you paying someone to answer the phone, do all of those things. That is just something your company has to have. Now, if you get this unique contract and it requires this crazy, oh, I don't know equipment well enough, some crazy piece of equipment that is not just standard for the work that you do and you have to rent that, generally that should count. And this is another great situation where Asking your CEO for an answer in writing can be very, very helpful. Even if they are not 100% correct, you have the ability to rely on that. So if they tell you not to worry about it, you may not have to worry about it. Safest bet is to take your contract, take the total value the government is paying. And this is why the definition is so broad. It talks about the total value paid by the government. So the total amount paid by the government to you. And then it says you cannot pay more than, for services, 50% of that money to anyone else that's not a small business. It doesn't clarify anything about that, what they have to be qualified as, a subcontractor, can it be an individual, a company, is it rentals, is it leasing? It doesn't really specify those things. So safe as that is to assume anytime you are paying a portion of that contract money to someone else, that you need to kind of put that in that bin of subcontracting. And there may be some exceptions, again, where there's no small businesses that can do the work and things like that. But the safest bet is to kind of do it that way generally. And if it does turn out that your pool of subcontracted work to non-small businesses is getting too large, that's when it's helpful to go in and start figuring out if you really can kind of maybe disqualify some of those things and, and take them off the chart completely as subcontracting. 
And that is very possible. Like mixed contracts are a big one because you are often able to like costs of equipment, I think it is, costs of materials, cost of materials is the keyword they use in there are things that you can sometimes pull out and say, look, this won't count. If you're doing a supply contract, but there's some service components, you can often pull out the service parts of it and just look at the total supply amount and then go from there. So it's such a fact specific analysis. There's not an easy answer to your question. It's going to depend on the contract and all of those things. But yeah, talking uh -huh. to your CEO and getting clarification is probably the safest way on that one. Perfect. Yeah, say, Thank you so much. We say I appreciate you get, all your time. I know it's super valuable. And of course, so absolutely. No, yeah. my pleasure. My pleasure. We say that you could almost answer every GovCon question with the words, it depends. Absolutely. <laughs> and it really does. You know. It does. But it does. By the way, we should have probably talked a little bit about this earlier, but if it's not a small business set aside, most to all of what we just talked about doesn't even really matter. It right. only matters when the government is setting aside and they want to intend that money to go to the small businesses. Well, and that's the thing. So some of the contracts I have now, the contracting officers want to change it to a Native American Indian set aside because that's what mm -hmm. I am or a veteran set aside. So I need to answer, be able to answer those questions because sometimes they're, like you said, knowledgeable and some aren't, but they all want to yeah. switch the contracts I have to American Indian set aside. Oh, and also side note, the state, if you are a service connected disabled veteran, the state of New York will contract with you. Oh, I will nice. put the contacts name in the chat for all service connected disabled veteran. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, we have looks like one more hand up from Paul Arnold. So, Paul, you're on. Yeah. Can you you can hear me? Yes. I'll make the question short as as I can. So, I'm in the real estate consulting industry. I've been in the industry for roughly 15, 20 years. But the services that I generally provide, I outsource, and I get some. I get often. Sometimes I get pushbacks about the subcontracting to uh to another uh, a particular service within the industry and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't i don't understand how, how they get to that point to determine that whether like for example of the, the previous carla talked about the services that they provided by the way the services that i engage with the companies that i engage with are small businesses as well and so it's i get a little bit confused of what the government looks at as what would be appropriate for a uh, subcontract I, I'm sorry, the question, I, I, I didn't know I was going to come on board. I'm going around the block three times, so I apologize. You're fine. Is your question kind of about similarly situated entities, that idea that you can subcontract to some without that counting against your subcontracting limitation? Yeah. What I position myself is as the project manager, contract manager, and then I work in conjunction with the small business that I'm providing the services with. And I happen to be a native firm, too. And then the subcontracting issues with Indian set aside even get more limiting when it, if it goes Indian set aside. You know, actually, here's what I would do, to be honest. And this is why I also use GovCon attorneys as well. If you had somebody like Nicole, because like we said, every situation depends on a little bit of a different scenario. And you know, a lot of times there's contracting officers inside of the government that might be new and or they might not keep up with what's going on the way that somebody like Nicole does. And what I would do in that circumstance, especially if I'm potentially going to lose out on an opportunity because they're saying, well, especially if it's a small business set aside and I'm subbing to another small business, you know, this whole like like entity uh, rule was not always a rule, you know, and so. That's why I say it's also important to stay up to date and current, because if people haven't been keeping up to date and current, there might be new rules that have come into effect and apply. So that's where I would leverage somebody like Nicole if I was in that situation. And I would just reach out to Nicole and say, hey, Nicole, here's our situation. Let me know what you think. Because and then when Nicole would say not only that, but she can maybe help to write some type of a justification on why yes. it's allowable for the agency to be able to use you as a subcontractor and that you meet all the compliance requirements. We have a lot of success just keeping things simple with agencies in that way too. We find a very amicable, respectful way of saying, hey, just not sure if you're aware of this. This is what our understanding is of the rules and limitations here. 
based on the contract, based on SBA's rules and the FAR. If you disagree, can you please point us to the correct ones? The amount of times we've done a very nice letter and we've suggested doing that before we file a protest of the solicitation or get into a big dispute about it, the amount of times they've turned around and just changed things and said, no, you're right, we're going to fix that and issue an amendment is actually pretty astounding. So it's a great, great plan. for Because yeah, it's pretty much black and white. What they're likely going to do is they'll send that to their legal counsel and their legal counsel will be like, oh, yeah, they're right. So yep. we better change yep. our position. Yep. yep. So I appreciate exactly. your time. Of course. All righty. Ben, let me unmute you, Ben. I saw his real hand. I didn't see his virtual hand. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm trying to look at where the virtual hand is. I couldn't locate it. All right. Obviously, I'm retired and I'm a, a small business uh, owner listed with the SAM entity and a few others. And recently, I got, recently meeting last Friday, I got uh, a communication from a contracting officer of a VA unit in New Jersey for some uh, services in the areas of uh, animal studies. Obviously, you know, that I cannot, all of it, I cannot do myself, but I'm familiar with this and I typically would do the data generation by other entities, but I will look into the report and preparation report and the whole managing of the project. So my question is, is 15% service fee of the total project, whatever that may be applicable in an area like this? I, I have no clue how to do pricing at all. So what is the meaning of 15%? Is it only for construction yeah. industry or service industries as well? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the 15% limitation we've been talking about is construction. If it's a service contract, generally, you're looking at a 50%. So 50% of the work done, it's a small business set aside. 50% of that work done would need to be done by you as the small business prime or another small business. And that combined. is, yes, yes. By combining combined. you and this. So you would yes. need, if it's a small business set aside, you would need to go and find another small business that does that service to meet the 50%. And then yes. beyond the 50%, you could subcontract out to other companies. Yep. To whoever you want, doesn't matter. Large business, doesn't matter. And I, I like to kind of think of it as two pools. So, you know, a chart in Excel, whatever it may be, this much. And it is based off of the money paid by the government. So we talk about work done based off the money paid. So the government pays you $100,000. That means that when all of this is said and done, you and any other small businesses need to collect $50,000. And then anyone else can collect the other $50,000. So you just kind of set that up. And as you are working, anytime you pay any portion of the contract sales out to somebody else, you just go ahead and look, are they small under that contract? If they're also small under the contract, it goes into that first pool of the stuff that you need to meet, the 50,000 you need to meet. If they're large, they go into that other pool. And then as you keep doing that, you realize if you need to make adjustments and a really good thing to note, anytime that you are subcontracting as a small business, highly, highly advise, including in your subcontracts, something to the extent of we have the right and ability to reallocate work if necessary to make sure that we are all meeting the limitations on subcontracting. And that gives you the ability to say, hey, I'm taking a little work from you, nothing against you, but you're large and I need to put a little back in this small business pool over here. And that's kind of the way that has to go. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, sample preparation, it is obviously uh, mice uh, brains uh, to do slices uh, uh, for microscopy slides to be made. So uh, that, that work has to be done at a, a small lab. I have worked with them in the past and they're willing to do so that they will, this would qualify for a small business unit. But the significant microscopy work will have to be done at a university lab. So a professor is also willing to do. So, but university is not small. Obviously, they're big, but the professor himself can be a small part of it. So how do I then go about asking for a budget? Or, or will the contracting officer tell me that, okay, this is the amount I'm going to pay you. So you figure out how you'll do it. And uh, it's up to me whether it is feasible or not. Or, or do I ask for a revised budget or... How does the whole process work? Because I never yeah. did anything at all. Yeah. So I, and I can't advise on the specifics of your situation. We could talk about that a little more if you wanted to email me. But in a nutshell, your solicitation is going to supposed to give you kind of baseline information, baseline information on the amount paid by the government, 
should have a note as to whether it's the limitation on subcontracting that applies or whether you can use the non-manufacturer rule exception if it's something where there's supplies involved. So that should give you that baseline information. As far as actually calculating what money is going where and whether it's considered small or large, that's going to be pretty nuanced. That's going to depend very heavily on your specific contract. Some contracts will have things in them about the fact that like the airline travel, like the hotels, there are just certain things that small businesses can't do. And so some of them will talk about those things and what it means if you have to subcontract to somebody to do some of those things. So I would say you want to look closely at the solicitation. It should give you a good starting point. And then once you look at that, yes, talking to your CO. As a bidder, you have every right to say, hey, listen, uh, as someone in the industry, because you have to keep in mind these government officials are typically not extremely knowledgeable on every industry. They're knowledgeable on contracting and they often reach out to others to draft the specs and, and the solicitations because they know the details. It's not really the government official that knows the details. So you as an industry expert have the ability to reach out and say, hey, this is the way this contract plays out in reality. And here's the things we have to consider. I need to know how this affects what you believe my compliance with this rule will be. They may give you great information. And if you get it in writing, I, it's great. You can usually rely on that and go from there. Uh, if they're more wishy-washy and not very helpful, then truthfully, as unfortunate as it is, your best bet is to hire an attorney shouldn't take a ridiculous amount of time, have them look at your solicitation, have them see if there's anything out there like waivers for certain services that small businesses don't generally do, and have them kind of help you come up with that calculation. I'll definitely follow up because I did receive from the D Department of Veteran Affairs from the CEO what is called a scope of work. A mm -hmm. scope of work, you know, spells out the details, what exactly is required, mm -hmm. but it doesn't talk about any value at all. So it is yeah. typically it's doesn't. Problem. Yeah, typically okay. just list the, the different uh, requirements of the contract. So the biggest important thing from the solicitation itself when it comes to what's going to apply as your rule is really going to be looking at the NAICS code, going to be looking at the total value paid by the government. And then if there is some kind of mixed, if there's some supplies and some services, that, that gets a little tricky. I won't go into it very long here. I know we're kind of trying to wrap things up, but Essentially, you may be able to divide parts of the contract and only consider some of it in your calculations. Okay, I'd be pleased to follow up with you separately because I don't want to take any yeah, time. No, that's... But I have your email ID. All righty. Hey, thank you. And thank I'm you. also, uh, I'm not sure if you're working with an Apex Accelerator, but I posted the link to the Association of Procurement Technical Assistance Center's website, aptech-us.org. They're a great resource as well. You know, it sounds like you're trying to put together some sales strategies and different things. So if you're not already working with them, I, I encourage you to reach out. They're another good resource funded by the Department of Defense. Nicole, I got one last question in the queue that just relates, and this would be yeah. a good also talk about the context of this. So somebody, as Ben was talking, said, is that tier one subs? But what I'd actually ask you is, how might this play out, I guess, if definitely like, okay, you bring in maybe a like entity, but maybe there's another large business who's subbing back out some to a small business at like a second tier, is that count or is it only for like similar situated entities where the work's going to only kind of count it across the first tier subs? Yeah, it's a great question. And generally any work's gonna count that's being subcontracted. So at first tier, second tier, doesn't matter. The safest way to protect yourself from that is when you are negotiating your first tier subcontracts, you make it abundantly clear in there that they are not allowed to subcontract out further without your approval. And the reason for doing that is to make sure if they're a small business and you are counting a certain amount of money that is going to them as small business money, they don't have the ability to turn around and hand it to a large business without you knowing because the government's not going to care. The government is still looking very broadly. Here's the amount we gave you, $100,000. How much of it's going small? How much of it's going big? They don't care who gives it to who. They don't care if it's called a subcontract. I've seen people try to argue, no, this is a consultant agreement. This has nothing to do with subcontracting. Well, it's still you giving a portion of contract money to that person. The main exception, again, is if, if you can argue it is not a portion of the contract money. If you can argue, no, 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 this is our general services that we pay for year round. 
That's not a part of the contract I'm subcontracting. That is simply something we have to acquire yearly and make sure we have done to keep our business going. That's the main exception. Otherwise, if it's arguable that a part of the funds is going to a business, you need to know if it's large or small, or if it's, again, 8A, it needs to be an 8A or not be an 8A. So it's important to put in there both that they need your permission and they need to notify you. And also that other caveat I gave, it's great to put in there, I'm the prime, I need to be able to reallocate work. And a lot of times we see pushback, especially from large business subs. They're like, so you can just take all of our work. So that's where you kind of get this fun middle ground where you say something to the extent of, A, you need to clear it with us if you're going to subcontract out so that we can make sure we're all abiding by the rules. And then B, we will be able to reallocate work if needed, but that is if it is strictly required to comply with the rules. And that's kind of that language that seems to make both parties feel a little better. And the prime would have to show, look, this is what we're at right now in the two pools. And we've got 70% going to large business. I have to move 20% of that over or we all lose this work. And so that's the way that I think the best way to handle that. Awesome. Well, yep. I think that wraps it up. And thank you so much again, Nicole, for the time today for the extra time. It was yeah. so great to have you add the value to this conversation from the legal perspective. You know, there's so much to kind of wrap your mind around here. But what I would say, guys, is like, that's where I'm passionate about it, being an education provider. You know, Nicole is one of the presenters on our platform. So we've got some really great training at govology.com. Check it out. Get the education. Um, I posted a link to the uh, aptag-us website. That's the Apex Accelerators. Uh, they, they're they out there. can be another part of your mastermind alliance. But definitely, you know, when you start to get into the nitty gritty of the things that are specific to your business, your contract, that's definitely where you're probably going to want to reach out directly to Nicole and just have a conversation about how that applies to your business, because that's the one thing that we really can't do with the education uh, on Gavology is make it specific to every situation, to every business, to every industry and to every contract, because just those <laughs> few things right there all kind of lead to a different answer. So anyway, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Nicole. Such a pleasure to have you. And we look forward to maybe having you back in the future where we have another uh, legal topic to address. <laughs> yeah, I'd love that. Thanks for having yeah. me. Thanks for organizing a, a great event as you always do. We appreciate you very much too. All right, likewise. Take care. All right.